morning. Uh, before we get into the message, I just want to say thank you to those of you who fill out that response card every week. Uh, it's really an encouragement to me as a teacher to know that you're taking next steps on your spiritual journey. And uh, this week we put eight next steps in the bulletin. Uh, I actually have more. I just we couldn't fit them in there. Um, but uh, we also have uh, two that are actually ten, including the barbecue. So. Um, Maybe consider what next steps you're willing to take this week and just mark that, mark that down so that we can be praying for you. And if you're going to be attending the barbecue, let us know. Uh, if you've already let us know, then don't do it again. We just want to know how much uh, food to prepare and, and games and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if this is your first time here, uh, we encourage everyone to fill out the response card every week. Um, we want to be praying for you and helping you along in your spiritual journey. So s- sometime between now and the end of the message, if you just... Uh, fill that out and uh, place it in the offering uh, basket sometime later. All right, we're in Titus 1, starting at verse 10 today. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to his friend Titus, uh, who is uh, working uh, in the churches on the island of Crete. And I'll read verses 10 through 16. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced because they're turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. This is true, so reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving, because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They're detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. So these are Paul's words to Titus about what I'm going to call meaningful confrontation, uh, the gift of admonishment, uh, the urgent importance of an authoritative warning in someone's life. Um, That's what I want to talk about today. My daughter, Lily, is a fearless climber. Um, She will climb to the top of almost anything that she can get her little toes and fingers into, Uh, anything like trees, buildings, uh, fences, swing sets, anything. Uh, I remember when I was her age, climbing to the top of a three-story building on the corner of our Chicago city street. Um, There were two apartment buildings, and um, they were so close together that in the gangway, you could actually get your arms and legs like positioned on the wall to the point where you could just scale up it. And so we would do this. We would scale all the way to the top, three stories, uh, when we were seven years old. Uh, We were latchkey kids with very little adult supervision. Um, (laughs) And now that I'm a parent of a seven-year-old and know the risks kids will take, um, I'm very cautious about letting Lily climb uh, so high on the things that she wants to climb. Uh, just a few weeks ago, on the 4th of July, she was climbing on a friend's uh, playground set. Uh, she was actually walking on the top of the playground set on the beam like it was a balance beam. It was like 10 feet high, and she fell. Um, she sprained her ankle. She hurt her arm pretty badly. Um, to, it's, it's a good thing that uh, there were no serious injuries. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, just after that, um, she was climbing a tree. We went on a hike, and she was climbing up this tree, and she was going a little bit higher than I felt comfortable with, And I would watch her, and I would warn her, and I would say something like, you know, if she started to do something dangerous, I'd say, Lily, I don't want you to fall and get hurt again, so be very careful. I gave her a stern, authoritative warning, because when you love someone and they're in danger, you warn them. That's just what people do. When a kid is in danger, parents don't say, you know, look at her playing on the edge of that cliff. What a dope. You know, like, you know, she think, you'd think she would know better than do that. Parents will talk directly to their kids, get away from the cliff. And this is not just true with parents and children. Imagine a coach of a team who would never bring correction to a misbehaving player. Imagine a conductor who never confronts an off-key soprano. 
Imagine a leader of a work group who never confronts someone who's not doing their fair share of the work. Imagine a CEO of a financial firm whose chief investment strategist pulled some of their money out of an investment just before it doubled in value and invested it rather in something that led to significant loss. Imagine this CEO complaining to the receptionist and lamenting to his stockholders, but never having the conversation with this misguided employee. You see what I'm getting at? If any of the people genuinely care about the community that they're a part of, and if they have any heart at all for the well-being of the individual, they'll go directly to that person who they have that problem with, and they'll fearlessly, honestly have a conversation with that person. I don't want you to fall and get hurt, so be very careful. You are on a road that could lead you to serious damage. You know, meaningful confrontation is actually a precious gift. If this gift is withheld, teams deteriorate, performances fail, families break apart, companies go bankrupt. The lack of appropriate, effective, meaningful confrontation is fatal to communities, and it could be lethal to individuals like you and me. It could be lethal. And if that's true for teams and companies and choirs, it is exponentially greater when it comes to God's dream, community in a church like this. And this is the Apostle Paul's great concern in this passage we read. Look back at verse 10. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless choices and uh, deceive others, This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced. This is very strong language Paul is using. They must be silenced. It's no wonder because Paul goes on to say, whole households are being ruined. Like families are being destroyed, Titus. You can't just stand by and watch this happen. That would be unthinkable. God's community is at stake. The community must be protected. And there are individuals in this community that are in real bad shape, Titus. Look at verse 12. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said among them, said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. This is true. These people have very, very serious character problems. And these people in Crete are known for this kind of thing. You know, even in our day, people who live in different areas uh, sometimes are known for different faults. If you kind of just think of the United States, think of just a couple states in the United States. So like, think of California. Think of uh, New York City. Um, I'll share with you a profile of these two areas. You just guess out loud which part of the country this profile represents. Obnoxious, aggressive, and overbearing. Who fits that? New York, right? We all kind of know that about New Yorkers. Uh, Okay, what about laid-back, pleasure-seeking, narcissistic wackos? (laughs) Uh, some of you are pleased because you think that's kind of a compliment Uh, that's the narcissism part in you Um, that's California you know when Kathy and I were in Ethiopia adopting our daughter we met some people from uh, Alabama who um, they were also adopting and we got to know them a little bit they couldn't believe I was a teaching pastor of a church in California Uh, They seriously believed there were not Christian churches in California. They had never been to California before, and they didn't know anyone from California. They just believed that there are no Christians in California. And uh, some of you may be profiling people from Alabama right now. (laughs) Well, Paul says, this testimony is true. It was kind of known among the Greeks. In fact, the Greeks actually coined a word, kritizo, which meant to deceive because it was so associated with the island of Crete. Now Paul says, this is true, they have these problems, but it's very interesting what he says in verse 13. Notice what he says. This is true, so. He has this little word, so. So reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. So, some translators will use the word therefore. Uh, Some will use for this reason. This testimony is true, therefore, this is what you should do. He doesn't say, this is true, therefore give up on them. I mean, they're just like hopeless cases. They'll never change. Don't expect anything different, Titus. You probably should just leave. He doesn't say, this is true, therefore gossip about them, Titus. Talk about their problems to sympathetic listeners under the guise of helping them to pray more intelligently. He doesn't say, Titus, it's none of your business. 
They have their own ways. They have their own faith, their own life. You have yours. They have theirs to each his own. Paul says, therefore, reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. Reprimand them sternly, Titus, because there's hope for them. They are not beyond the power of God. Therefore, reprimand them sternly. Confront them. If you do this, Titus, it will prevent them from moving in this uh, direction that would eventually lead to their disaster. We've already seen in verse 11, it says this, they are turning whole families away from the truth. And look what's going to happen to individuals in verse 15. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their mind and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. Individuals were being warped and destroyed. And in Titus 3.10, uh, Paul talks about the whole church being in peril. Divisive people can break apart a whole church. And that's all the consequence of non-confrontation. You know, this emphasis on meaningful confrontation is not just found in this one letter in the New Testament. This is all over the New Testament. Paul says to the church at Colossae in Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. That's meaningful confrontation. Admonishment is a strong authoritative warning. Paul says to the church at Rome in Romans 15, 14, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to admonish one another. He says you are competent. You are competent to admonish one another. Meaningful confrontation, admonishment, was expected by the New Testament writers to be a standard in the early church. It was just standard operating procedures in the early church. Without it, we can expect the same results as in Crete. Uh, endangered families, shipwrecked lives, and splinter churches. You know, there's a famous passage in Matthew 18 about conflict resolution. Uh, some of you may have heard me teach on Matthew 18 before. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 18, 15 and following, he says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. And I've talked to you about this whole critical importance of going directly to the person who you have an offense with uh, or have conflict with and speaking face-to-face and one-on-one with that person. And if that doesn't work, although you try your best with a sincere heart and with prayer and all that, um, you can't get resolution, then you're to go get help. You're to bring someone else. Eventually, you may need to involve someone from our leadership team. Uh, it says go to the church. And in the future for us, the final court of appeal will be the elders. And it's important that we as a church learn to handle conflict according to the teachings of Jesus. I want us to know and to practice Matthew 18 in this church to the point where the common language around here becomes, oh, you two are in conflict with each other. You need to do Matthew 18 with each other. Uh, If someone comes to you with a complaint about someone else, I would love for your first response to be, have you gone to that person? Have you gone to that person face-to-face and one-on-one to try to resolve it? And if you haven't, then you refuse to listen to the gossip about that person. Now, the reason I bring this up is this. There's a difference between conflict resolution, uh, what Jesus teaches about in Matthew 18, and meaningful confrontation or admonition or admonishment. And the difference is this. In confrontation, my obligation is to help you by warning you or admonishing you, even though we may not be in any conflict at all. And this requires all the skills that are involved for the Matthew 18 kind of conflict resolution uh, and some. Uh, it adds the need for great humility as well. Confrontation is really kind of a, like a broader category that conflict resolution is just kind of a sub part of. I need to be admonishing you and you need to be admonishing me. We need to be admonishing one another uh, when we see one another off. Um, we're off track. Even if we're not in conflict with each other. It might not be an offense against me, but I still see that there's something that I need to point out in you. 
I may not have sinned against you personally, so we don't need to resolve anything between the two of us, but maybe I have sinned, and, um, and I need you to point it out in me so that I can get back on track. And I don't think this happens nearly as much as it should these days, especially in the church. Um, I think it's because we live with such individualistic attitudes. Um, the mindset of our culture is, my life is my business, your life is your business. If we're in conflict, okay, that's fine. We'll confront each other. But other than that, you mind your own business and I'll mind my own, I'll mind my own business. And I want to tell you that that mindset is a departure from what was expected in the church during most of its history. This is not the mindset that God wants to be characterized by his people. You know, it's your business, it's your life, do whatever you want to do with it. This week I was amazed to read in the life of person after person and writer after writer in the early, uh, the early centuries of the church how over and over again church fathers and mothers wrote that meaningful con- confrontation is critical to the health of the church. For a church to try to be a church without admonishment, they would say it's unthinkable because growth in faith and grace simply won't happen apart from admonishment. And just like conflict the resolution has a classic text in Matthew 18, there's also a classic text for meaningful confrontation, and it's in Galatians 6, starting at verse 1. If you want to look at it, it'll be up on the side screens. This is what Paul writes. This is a classic text on uh, uh, admonishment or a confrontation. Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are spiritual should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So in the time that remains in this talk, I just want to go over the nuts and bolts of this business of admonishment or meaningful confrontation. And I need you to know that I am not an expert at this. This is something that I am uh, learning in myself. But I want us to learn this because here's what I think. I think this is going to be one of the greatest tests of our maturity as a church to be able to appropriately, effectively confront someone without judgmentalism or superiority or spiritual pride and to be able to receive that uh, openly uh, without getting defensive or crushed, uh, this is going to be a a great test for us as a church. So let's just walk through what Paul says to the church at Galatia about confrontation. And the first question about this is, when is confrontation needed? Paul says, It's needed if another believer is overcome by some sin. Now, he doesn't say if someone has a personality quirk that I don't particularly like. It's not needed when someone likes music that I don't like or wears clothes that aren't my style. It's not like a nitpicky, fault-finding, spiritual kind of thing. There's not, there's not like a, um, a, a personal agenda in this. He also doesn't say if anyone commits a sin, not if anyone commits a sin, because someone might actually be guilty of committing a sin or some wrongdoing. They might actually be aware of it and repent of it and change, and then you don't need this. He says, if someone is overcome. The idea here is if a person is involved in misbehavior, uh, very possibly involving a pattern of misbehavior, a tendency or a habit strong enough that it gets noticed by people around him, Uh, but they appear not to recognize it themselves. There's not an admission of guilt. There's not evidence of repentance. There's not movement toward change. It's like they're overcome or they're stuck. Um, I'll give you some examples. Maybe someone you know habitually neglects their children. Like God has entrusted these little lives to them, and they're just blowing past it. And they don't even recognize it. They don't seem to be aware of it at all. Maybe someone has a problem with anger, And they're using words in a way that hurt the people around them on a fairly regular basis. And they're just not even aware of it. And they're not changing. Maybe you know someone whose pace of life is unhealthy and it's keeping them from being the kind of person that God wants them to be. It's keeping them from intimacy with God. Maybe you know someone who on a fairly regular basis distorts the truth, embellishes, exaggerates, deceives, maybe to avoid pain or to manipulate people to get what they want, and no one is calling them on it. No one is confronting them. No one has the courage or the love to confront them. Maybe you know someone who is just cold in their heart 
toward God or toward people. Maybe you know someone who's living in a habitual attitude of complaint or ingratitude, and it's just like killing them relationally. Like other people are just starting to avoid them. No one's talking to them. Confrontation is needed when someone I know and someone I love, someone I care for, is overcome or stuck. Now Paul says when someone is overcome, what should you do? How should you respond? He says this, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are spiritual should what? Should gently and humbly help that person. He doesn't say ignore what they're doing and maybe it'll go away, which is what happens way too often in churches. He doesn't say complain about them you know, to a close friend and maybe they'll hear about it secondhand and straighten up. He doesn't say give up on them and be th- thankful that you're superior to them. He says gently and humbly help them. And I'll tell you the flip side of this. When someone you know well and you love is stuck in sin and you see it, or at least you have a a good idea to suspect it and you do nothing, you are violating community. This is a remarkable statement. I never noticed this until this week. Look at Leviticus 19.17. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront them directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Now notice what the writer is saying. He's making a contrast here. He's saying, don't hate them. He's saying, instead of hating them, confront them. In other words, when confrontation is needed, offer it constructively, offer it wisely and lovingly, but offer it when it's needed. If you don't offer confrontation, that's a form of hatred. And not only that, he says, confront people directly so that you will not be held guilty for their sin. In other words, if you fail to confront them when it's needed, you share in their guilt. And this has always been understood when people take Christian communities seriously. Martin Luther said, my failure to instruct and rebuke my brother is actually an evidence of my anger. And we think it's the other way around. We think that confrontation is evidence of like inappropriate anger or something like that. When confrontation is offered in a spirit, in the right spirit, in the right time, in the right way, it is not appropriate. It's actually an expression of love. It's the withholding of it that's an expression of hostility. Because what's that, what that's really saying is, I don't think you're capable of anything better than what you're living right now. I don't think you're capable, with the help of God in your life, of growing beyond this sin that you're stuck in than what you're doing right now. Or if you are, I don't care enough about you to be willing to go through the pain that it might happen in an unpleasant conversation. Either it's saying, I don't think you're capable, with God's help, of growth, or it's saying, I don't care enough about you to want you to grow. It's just an absolute violation of what's at the heart of God's plan for his community between men and women. And if you don't offer confrontation when it's needed, it's actually a form of hostility. You know, a lot of you are parents. One of the great gifts that you can give your children is to teach them to prize corrective feedback, to be open to it and eventually to prize it. You know, many times in my home, I will reprimand one of my daughters very sternly. And they'll say, thank you, Dad, for the reprimand. (laughs) And then they'll fly with their little angel wings into the kitchen and cook dinner for the whole family. Um, To prize corrective feedback is a mark of great maturity. And this is spoken about consistently in Scripture, very often in the book of Proverbs. I look at Proverbs 25.12. To one who listens, valid criticism is like a gold earring or it's like gold jewelry. To the one who prizes feedback, it's like gold jewelry. It's like a gift. This is a great verse for your children. You should have your children memorize this verse because not only does it show the worth of a reprimand, it also indicates that body piercing is a biblical practice. (laughs) A gold earring, it'll be useful to them in a number of ways. All right, so when is confrontation needed? When someone is overcome or stuck, when someone is caught? And then what do I do when confrontation is needed? Uh, Galatians 6.1 says, gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. You go to that person. 
Uh, you don't ignore it. You don't gossip about it. You don't get superior about it or any of that kind of junk. You go directly to that person in love. Now, who ought to do this? Who should do the confronting? Paul says this, If another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are spiritual should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. He doesn't say pastors. He doesn't say elders. He doesn't say teachers. He says, you who are spiritual. And you know, there's nothing magic about that word spiritual either. It simply means you who have the Spirit. You who are sincerely seeking to allow the Holy Spirit to have influence in your life. And I imagine that's probably almost everyone in this room. Now, if you're struggling with a spirit of superiority or judgmentalism or something like that, you should not be the one who's doing the confronting. But if you can honestly, sincerely say, and it would be confirmed by spiritually mature people around you, that you sincerely seek to allow the Holy Spirit to have influence in your life, then it's your job to do the confronting. Just don't do it apart from asking the Holy Spirit for help and spending time in prayer and then being sensitive to Holy Spirit's leading in your life. And I just want to say a special word here to those of you who are planning on being uh, connect group leaders or you are currently uh, connect group leaders here at Blue Oaks. Appropriate, meaningful confrontation is absolutely critical. It is absolutely essential to healthy community. We will not grow into Christ-likeness um, apart from this. And you won't get much help in our society. You won't even get much help from the church at large because I think the church has just drifted from this. You don't hear this much in the church. If it's going to happen in this church, mostly it's going to happen in little communities. That's where it's going to happen. It's not going to happen in large group gatherings like this. It's not going to happen by me standing up here and like admonishing you like one by one, name by name. That would just be weird. Um, it's going to happen in little communities. So group leaders and facilitators, I just want to encourage you and challenge you on this. If you don't model this and talk about this and study this and receive it openly and live in it, you are denying the people in your group this indispensable gift of growth. Now that brings me to the next very important question. How do we carry it out? Like, how do we carry out meaningful confrontation? And I'm going to go through four different ways that we can carry it out, four aspects to meaningful confrontation. And the first one Paul mentions is gentleness. Confront with gentleness. You should restore that person gently. You need to admonish that person with gentleness. You need to use a scalpel, not a machete. Use questions. They can be helpful. Like if there's someone that needs to be confronted, you go to them and you begin by saying something like this, I've seen something that I'd like to point out to you, that you do or you say, and I think it will help you. Can I tell you about it? Maybe you use something like that because very often people respond much more openly, much more constructively to conf confrontation if they're actually giving you permission to do it first. And they know that you're coming with the right spirit. And you need to let them know that your heart is not to attack them. Uh, now, if your heart is to attack them, then don't do it. But if you can honestly say um, with great sincerity that um, you're coming with a spirit of love, you can just say, I have a concern with something that you say or do. Can I just talk to you about it? Or there's a phrase that um, we sometimes use. I think there's a lot of wisdom in this phrase. Help me understand this. Help me understand this. In other words, you're saying, this is what I see. Like, this is my concern. Maybe there's missing uh, information that I'm not aware of, and so I just don't want to make any assumptions here. Help me understand this. This is a way of raising the concern real clearly without automatically blaming someone. Paul says this is part of why this is such a test for our maturity. When we're involved in this, we're involved in the kind of spiritual surgery that leads to healing and transformation in a person's life. And spiritual surgery requires great precision. You need to cut just enough to do constructive work and not so much that you actually uh, destroy. And so Paul says, do it gently. Do it with a careful spirit. But then there's a second way in which confrontation must be done, and it's kind of the counterpart of this one. Confront gently, but then confront with truth. And I would say confront with the whole truth. 
when people go to take an oath in court, or at least this is the way I've always seen it in the movies, they'll put their hand on the Bible and they'll be asked the question, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And I think what happens for many of us is we shrink back from telling the whole truth that needs to be told. And in most cases where confrontation is difficult, this is the game changer. Game changer. When you confront someone, you will be tempted in that moment to tell part of the truth and then shrink back from telling the whole truth. I've talked to you about this before, this idea of uh, telling the last 10%. It's something I learned from Bill Hybels in his book, Axiom. When you're in a confrontational situation with someone, there will be this last 10% that is the hardest thing to say, but it's like the most important thing that needs to be said. And most of the effectiveness of confrontation rests on whether or not in that moment you will have the courage to say the whole truth. Why do we hold back from doing that? I want to tell you what I think uh, most of us do. In Titus 2.15, this is what Paul says, You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone disregard what you say. Don't let anyone disregard what you say, Titus. Don't hold back because you're concerned about what other people might think of you. I think the number one reason we shrink back from telling the whole truth is simply fear. You know, maybe they won't like me. Maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I am. Maybe they'll think that I'm trying to act superior. Maybe this will be an an unpleasant situation. And as long as my primary goal is to make sure no one disapproves of me, I'll actually never do this well. I'll never learn to do it well. If I'm not willing to run that risk, I might as well just quit now. You know, maybe you're a group leader and there's someone in your group who talks too much because there are these kinds of people in the world and other people in that group pressure you because you're the leader. Come on, leader, do something about this. And you'll be tempted to tell just the truth. I don't think our small group went really well last week. We, you know, we have some new people there, and I think we should do a better job of letting them talk. You know, we need to do a better job of listening. It's true, but it's not the whole truth. It's not clear what the problem is, and it's not clear who has the problem. The whole truth would be, I'm concerned for you. Uh, and I'm concerned for our group. You know, you're talking too much, and you're not listening well, and I'm, I'm not sure that you actually read people in the group very well. I'm not sure you realize the effects that you're monopolizing the conversation has on other people, and I just want to talk to you about that. I think you could do better. And I want to help you think about why this might be going on in your life and how we can change it. Like, that would be the whole truth. And I'll give you another piece of guidance while we're on this. Uh, when you tell someone the whole truth, there will be tension. Very rarely will the other person say, man, I'm so glad you told me this. You know, I was kind of thinking that I was talking too much, but I really didn't know, so I'm so glad. This is going to be really helpful for me. Let me tell you why I talk so much. I'd like to talk to you for a a little bit about it. (laughs) When you tell the whole truth, uh, there will be tension. Don't relieve that tension prematurely. I had a confrontation situation where I had to sit down with someone and tell them something that was very difficult. And, um, and after I did, we just sat there for a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity. And then the person's response was, you know, I think that's true. And I had to fight my initial tendency because my first tendency in that moment was to say, man, I'm so glad you understand what I'm talking about. I'm so glad we had this talk. And to kind of like relieve the tension to kind of let them off the hook. I had to fight myself and say, no, there's still some more tension. There's still some more silence that we need to endure because there's still some more work that needs to get done in your life. Tension can be a very powerful way for people to be motivated to do self-examination and change. While they're making their way toward clarity and insight, tension can actually be a really good thing. Don't release it too soon. All right, so confront with the whole truth that the person needs to hear. Be gentle with it, but don't just tell the truth, tell the whole truth. And then the third way uh, in which confrontation needs to be done, so confront with gentleness, confront with the whole truth, and then the third way is confront with humility. And this is so important. This is why Paul says what he does when he's writing to the Galatians, you who are spiritual should gently and humbly 
help that person back onto the right path. And he says in verse 3 of Galatians 1, if you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. I think the number one criteria, the criteria perhaps for someone to engage in confrontation is you better be in touch with your own depravity. You better be in touch with your own wrongdoing and your own sin. Any spirit of self-righteousness or pride or uh, spiritual uh, superficiality or superiority will just do damage. It just will. So be in touch with your own wrongdoing. Be in touch with your own depravity. This is what one ancient author wrote uh, many centuries ago. Do those who reprove the faults of others do so in a humble spirit? Indeed, by an act of great kindness, listen to this, by an act of great kindness, God often allows those who correct the faults of others to fall unpleasantly themselves so that from their own fault, they may learn how merciful they ought to be in the rebuke of others. A friend was telling me about a guy who he went to school with. Uh, He went to a Christian college, and this guy considered himself to be one of Jesus' most devoted soldiers. And his calling was to straighten out all the less devoted soldiers. And he would talk about how regular and intense his devotional life was and how badly he felt about other people who didn't have as of an intense, like, devotional life. And he used language full of, like, amens and alleluias and things like that. And he would talk about how deeply he grieved over his sin. Uh, But his sins were like tiny sins, like microscopic little sins, almost virtues, uh, that left you marveling at what a tender conscience this guy had. He would lament over the lack of spiritual commitment and fervor of other students. Uh, He never came right out and said this, but you kind of got the feeling that if God were considering adding a fourth person to the Trinity, like he would be on the list. And so one day, he was on a trip with other students to the Holy Land, to Israel, and he assembled a group together to take their picture, and while he was doing it, he dropped his camera, his prized camera, and it fell on the rocks beneath him, and it broke into many, many pieces, and there was a moment of silence, and then he uttered a single syllable, a bad word for stuff you don't want to step in, and then there was another moment of silence, And then you could hear some people in the group saying, Amen and Alleluia. (laughs) Uh, Not because coarse language is a good thing, but because he was so self-righteous and so full of like spiritual hot air that it so badly needed to be punctured. And for like a moment, it was. You know, when you go to reprove someone, uh, if you can't say sincerely, you know what, I am capable of this. Like, given the right circumstance, uh, I'm in touch with enough with my own capacity for sin to know that I'd be capable of this, or even worse than this, because I know my own darkness better than I know anyone else's darkness. And if you can't say that, if there's a kind of spiritual, uh, just like twisted joy in you, like which can happen in me, if there's that spirit in you, you'd better stop. you better back off. you better do some more business with God before you're ready to go confront that person. Meaningful confrontation has to be done with humility. When we do Matthew 18, we're saying, we have a conflict, so that's why I'm coming to you. When we do Galatians 6, we're saying, I think you have a problem. And the potential for self-righteousness is so great, and that's why it requires an enormous amount of humility. Galatians 6 takes all the skill of Matthew 18 uh, plus enormous humility. And then there's a fourth way in which a confrontation needs to be carried out. Uh, confront with patience. Paul says in Ephesians 4 to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Sometimes confrontation gets short-circuited because We are just an impatient people. Like, transform now is like what we think or what we want. Uh, I told you how you should change. Now get on with it and change your life. And we expect people to just like get it and to change it overnight. You can't FedEx confrontation. Uh, You can't get overnight uh, or transformation. Generally, there's a connection with problems and healing. Uh, The deeper a problem goes, Uh, Those are the ones where people get caught or stuck in the longer the healing process. 
the longer it takes to see it and to acknowledge it and to begin to change. I think of a situation where a confrontation happened recently and the person who did the confronting had one conversation. And then it was frustrated because the person didn't change overnight and was ready to pretty much write this person off. And here's the deal on this one. I want to ask you a question. How patient is God with you? Like, think of your life. How patient is God with you? If God is that patient with you, don't you think you have some work in this area of patience? I mean, don't you think we can bear with one another for a little bit longer? Now, again, there's kind of an escalating response involved in passages that teach on this. If someone shows, like, a stubborn, unwilling spirit and they refuse to yield and they refuse to engage and they refuse to acknowledge something, uh, it can get to a certain point, scriptures teach. Paul talks about this in Titus 3.10 with divisive people. Uh, Jesus talks about this in Matthew 18 where for the protection of the community, maybe this person needs to be put outside of the community. But that's real serious. Like he's talking about a real serious deal. You don't just do that after one conversation. There's a patience factor involved. And if you're uh, willing to do that, to confront with gentleness, with truth, with humility, and with patience, this really will lead to life change in another person. You hold, essentially, in your hands a gift that another person desperately needs. And God may want to use you because you have the eyes to see it to bring about significant change in another person's life. And some of you know who this is already. Like God may have brought this person to your mind, uh, their name or their face, and you know who it is. And you need to insert their name in that fill in the blank and the next steps on your bulletin. You're in a position to do this. And so today, I want to ask you, I want to challenge you, will you love them enough to do it? Will you be submitted before God enough to pray and to think about how to do it wisely and to think about this person for whom Christ died, who is part of this community maybe, and say to them, can you help me understand something? You know, I've kind of seen this thing that you do or say, um, can I tell you about it? Some of you have received this from other people. Some of you are going to receive it maybe soon, maybe sometime today after this message. Uh, The phone may ring tonight or this week with someone who wants to set up an appointment to do Galatians 6 with you this week. Will you receive it? Will you receive it with openness? Will you have the kind of courage and character not to get defensive or crushed by it? Remember, it's not your worth that's at stake. That was reconciled and resolved at the cross a long time ago. It's not your worth, it's your growth that's at stake. Well, for us as a church, this is one of our ultimate tests. And if we can master this, it really will be true of us what Paul said a long time ago in Ephesians 4.16. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And I think we could do this, I really do. All right, let's pray as Justin comes back up and the ushers come forward to receive the offering. God, we're so grateful for uh, the practical truth in these passages in the New Testament. So many of us can see so clearly areas in other people's lives where they're just off track, and if they keep going on that road, it's going lead to lead to destruction, and we need to be the warning for them like I am for my daughters because I love them. You need to be careful. You're going to hurt yourself. God, help us to approach those people this week with great gentleness and humility and, and truth and not to hold anything back, but with great humility, recognizing our own sin. And God, I pray that you would do a work in us in, uh, as individuals and in us as a church as you continue to transform us more into your likeness. Help us to be more Christ-centered as a result of some of these confrontations that we need to make and that need to be made with us. God, help us to uh, approach people that need to be approached with uh, great sincerity, with courage and boldness. God, I know some of us in this room are people pleasers and we won't do this (laughs) because it's just too difficult. But God, I pray that by their spirit, by your spirit, you would give them the strength 
to do, to do this. I, I believe that they would be the best at doing this because they're so sensitive and care about the people around them. So God, help us. Give us uh, your spirit as we approach people to try to help them, to give them warnings and just try to reprove them and admonish them and, and uh, help them to grow spiritually. And God, would you help us as people come to us? Um, God, I, I say, God, if someone comes to me, God, help me to not be defensive to not um, feel crushed by the weight of whatever it is, but to realize it's going to help me grow and it's going to help me become uh, better as a human being and as a follower of you. And So God, would you do your work? Would you refine us, help us to become better? Give us um, these kinds of meetings this week and I pray that you just work powerfully in our congregation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.